Welcome to the National Press Club. My name is John Hughes. I'm an editor for Bloomberg's First Word. That's Bloomberg News's breaking news desk here in Washington. And I am the president of the National Press Club. I want to welcome you to today's event. Our speaker is Puerto Rico Governor Alejandro Garcia Padilla, who will discuss the financial state of his country and new developments, including some new developments just within the past 24 hours. But first, I want to introduce our distinguished head table. This table includes club members and guests of the speaker, and they will stand when their name is announced. From the audience's right, Charles Snyderman, a reporter with Audio Video News, Connie Lawn, a contributor for Salem Radio Network and a blogger for Huffington Post, and she has covered the White House for almost 50 years. Aileen Schleff, president of Creative Alliance Communications and board member for the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Silvana Quiroz, a producer and anchor at Univision Washington. Cesar Miranda Rodriguez, Secretary of Justice for Puerto Rico. Donna Lainwan Leger, breaking news editor at USA Today, a former National Press Club president and vice chair of the club's speakers committee. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, Kasia Klimasinska. She's a Bloomberg News economic policy reporter and she organized today's lunch for the speakers committee. Thank you, Kasia. Elena Isella, associate producer at Fox News Channel. Jean Coletta, editor of Latin America Advisor Newsletters, which is part of Inter-America, that's hashtag NPC Live on Twitter. Well, Puerto Rico, to put it plainly, is in deep financial trouble. The U.S. territory's population is the size of Oklahoma, yet its debt of $70 billion is greater than any U.S. state except for California and New York. Puerto Rico is poorer than the poorest U.S. state. Its economy has been in recession for about a decade. The territory and its agencies have $957 million in debt payments that are due on January 1st. There are questions over whether firefighters and school teachers will be paid. The island found it easy to borrow because the bonds it issues are exempt from local, state, and federal taxes all over the U.S. However, the shrinking economy and taxpayers escaping to the mainland in the hope for a better future have made it more difficult to pay off the debt. Governor Padilla, leader of the island's popular Democratic Party, wants Congress to allow the U.S. territory to declare bankruptcy. Padilla, who was elected governor in 2012, told a Senate committee earlier this month, quote, let us be clear, we have no cash left. Padilla, who is not seeking re-election, said that allowing Puerto Rico to declare bankruptcy would give the territory the ability to restructure the debt in a court-supervised process. The Obama administration supports the bankruptcy request. Congress held five hearings on the issue this year and introduced at least a half dozen bills that would help Puerto Rico but none of these bills has passed in either chamber. But just last night, congressional leaders announced that the year-end spending bill expected to win approval this week includes aid for Puerto Rico. According to lawmakers, this bill provides almost $900 million to Puerto Rican doctors and hospitals over the next decade. It does this by increasing payments for the hospital stays of Medicare patients in Puerto Rico. 
Now, to give us the very latest on what this aid will mean for Puerto Rico's financial plight and whether it will be sufficient to help Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico get through the winter, we now turn to the governor himself. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm National Press Club welcome to Governor Alejandro Garcia Padilla. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Hughes, for that kind introduction and for inviting me to join you today. My constituents are strong, hardworking, proud American citizens. We have has always answered these stress calls when the rest of the country has sent them. Hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans have bravely answered the highest calling, serving and giving their lives in disproportionate number in every armed conflict since the Great War. Millions of Puerto Ricans, men and women, continue to proudly and selflessly serve our common good and contribute to their communities, both here, in the mainland, on the island, and overseas. Their, pet their patriotism, productivity, and pride are felt in every industry, in every state. In recent years, Puerto Rico's economy, economic issues have been in the news, and many of you have highlighted the problem my people face. And we have made it very clear that we need help. I plan, I plan this trip with optimism, truly expecting that by today, Congress will have act to give us the tools we need. Why was I, was I optimist? I will give you four very simple reasons. One, because of the obvious severity of the crisis we face in Puerto Rico. The Commonwealth has lost access to the credit market. We have been able to provide essential services only because we are withholding tax refunds and vendor payments, and because we have sold assets from our work workers' compensation insurance funds and our pension funds. People, sometimes our best trained people, are leaving the island in mass, mostly to Central Florida, this rate would only increase as our economy continues to deteriorate. Two, because the restructuring of Puerto Rico's debt is inevitable, and the financial market knows that. Three, because without a tested restructuring mechanism, a default will be chaotic leading to complex and very costly litigation. And four, because a federally legislated restructuring framework will avoid chaos without costing one penny to the United States taxpayers. But today, today I am extremely disappointed. Why? Because yesterday, yesterday Congress missed an opportunity to do the right thing. Hedge funds proved more persuasive over Congress than the well-being of 3.5 million American citizens living in Puerto Rico. I want to repeat that. 
hedge funds prove more persuasive over Congress than the well-being of 3.5 million American citizens living in Puerto Rico. The people of Puerto Rico are in the midst of a humanitarian crisis. We are losing our workers, our consumers, our tax base that is essential to our economy recovery. Since I took office in January 2013, my administration has taken bold emergency measures to address this crisis. I reduced 24% of our expenditures, 24% of our expenditures. We approved additional revenue measures, including increasing the gas tax and water rates. We dramatically reduced government expenditures and froze collective bargaining agreements. Public transportation routes have been cut. Our largest pension fund was dramatically reformed and a new tax on transferring, transfer pricing was put in place. Puerto Rico is currently transitioning from the sales tax to a value-added tax with an 11.5% rate. We reduced through attrition around 15,000 positions from the government prayer payroll, entering essential services to Puerto Rican families. In June, I laid out a comprehensive report on our crisis and, re and a realistic picture of our future. And the, re the reality is that we cannot pay our debt. We cannot pay our debt. Earlier this month, I announced that the Commonwealth will meet our debt obligation by defaulting on junior bonds to try to pay bonds backed by the full faith and credit of the Commonwealth. We are, as we say in Spanish, uh, as a say in Spanish goes, desvistiendo un santo para vestir otro. Or as you say, robbing Peter to pay Paul. But there's, there's something very, very important to understand this. It's important to remember
business leaders and labor leaders to chart our next steps. Thank you for having me and for your time. Thank you so much, Governor. I mentioned in the introduction, while uh, Congress didn't give you what you came here looking for, they did say that you're, you're going to get $900 million in Medicare over the next 10 years. What, what does this accomplish? How much does this help? Imagine that a patient get to an emergency room with a stroke and is treated with the diet, the patient will die. What Congress did is telling us, you are having a stroke, you need to eat better. Uh, thanks, but no thanks. They did nothing. So what do you do now with Congress? Do you continue to lobby? Do you continue to work this, or, or what happens next? Uh, we will continue. Uh, the facts are there. They know the facts. That there's no single argument. And let me, let me be very clear. The restructuring process will be good for every party. The creditors and, 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 and Puerto Ricans, the absence of that framework will be bad for everybody. Not, not having that framework will just get us into a litigation that will be very expensive, very complex in different courts everywhere in the United States and Puerto Rico and, and maybe overseas because there's no legal structure. Without a reason, without reason, Puerto Rico was, Puerto Rico was took out from the code in 1984, the, the bankruptcy code 1984, without reason. No one says why. And this will be a real crisis. And, and, and we will need to fight in every court in the United States. It will be, who, which creditor will have seniority uh, 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 in front of the other. Who will determine that? Who will collect the f first? In, what, in which court a judge will determine that? No one no. No one no. They will be fighting each other. They won this round. And Puerto Rico will, and will never have enough money to put in, in, in Congress halls to lobby in favor of, of, of fairness that they, that, that they just did, and they are about to do it again. But we will fight back. This questioner says, it's clear from the negotiations on this omnibus bill, this bill that we're talking about, it's clear from these negotiations that Republicans don't want to give Puerto Rico access to bankruptcy protection. So will you keep asking for that specifically, or will you change? Do you need to uh, come with a new type of proposal for them? Puerto Rico and the administration concludes, everybody that have thinking about this concludes that th there's only one way to tackle the issue, not to kick the can. What they approve is a way of trying to help to kick the can. Let's give you 90, 90 million a year for 10 years when you have a $70 billion debt. I'm not asking for a bailout, I'm asking for the tools. And I told them in the first hearing a couple of months ago, that if they do not act, it will be more expensive, and it will be, and the ball will remain in their court. I was asking for them to send the ball to my court, to give me the tools. It's a Puerto Rican issue, and we want to solve it, but we need the tools. 
I was asking for the tools, and I'm asking for the tools. If they do not act, the ball will remain in Congress court. Today, the ball is in Congress court. So could you walk us through what will happen on January 1st when Puerto Rico faces this $957 million debt payment? Are you planning to pay at least some of it or delay the payment? What will you do? We, Puerto Rico will default in January or uh, in May. There's no money. I have not the, the printing machine. <laughs> There's no money. And the Constitution guarantees the people of Puerto Rico to provide essential services. And I have no money to provide essential services and to pay the, the creditors. And they need to understand that. What? And uh, what, what we will do? I, 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 I'm always doing my best to do both things, but time will come very soon and will probably be on January 1st. I'm trying to avoid that. But probably will be on January 1st that I will not have money to do both things. And if they make me choose between Puerto Ricans and creditors, I will choose Puerto Ricans. Always. <laughs> That there's no question about it. If I need to choose to pay an essential service to Puerto Ricans or a creditor, they, 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 can, they, can, they can swear that I will choose Puerto Ricans. So what will happen when you default? I will be sued. Uh, there will be an issue of cash, and uh, government may close. Essential service will be lost. I will not have money to pay essential services like like security, like healthcare, like uh, pr providing healthcare, uh, uh, and 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 what will happen? What will that provoke? That our, our economy go to the bottom again? And if the economy go to the bottom again, what will happen? Next month I will have less money to collect. If I have less money to collect, I will have less money to provide services and to pay creditors, and 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 so on, so on, so. So every month will be worse for who? For us and for creditors. Because then every, we will get to the, that debt spiral that we were we was trying to avoid. Who put us into that debt spiral? Creditors and Congress. And then it will be expensive. Because to uh, uh, put the Puerto Rico economy into its feet again, that will cost. That will cost. What we ask will cost nothing. So, so we are about to get into a humanitarian crisis just compared to an to a, a, a atmospheric uh, disaster in Puerto Rico. Just compared to that. I believe in your talk, you mentioned a 24% budget cut that you had made. What about additional budget cuts? Do you anticipate more budget cuts? More than 80% of our budget is to pay police people, firefighters, nurses and the medical center, and teachers. 80 percent. So we, we get to the bone. We get to the bone already. There's, there's no, no one else to cut. I, I, I reduce 75 percent external contract contracts in, in, in government agencies. 75 percent. For each four dollars we spend in contracts in agencies, we are spending one. But they want me to fire people. If I do that, if I fire people, I will damage the economy. So I will get to that debt spiral. And again, that will be choosing them between Puerto Rico uh, 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 against Puerto Ricans. I will not do that. You have said before that if Congress doesn't act, you will turn to the White House for help. What exactly will you ask the White House to do, and can the White House take any unilateral action outside of Congress to help you? 
that we find out there's no administrative action without congressional uh, uh, action that will solve the problem. So if they are waiting for Jack Lou or for the president to solve the problem, the, the, we, we haven't found out a way where without congressional action will be different than kicking the can. There's ways we think, and we have been working with, with or, um, or uh, arguing in Treasury that to kick the can. But it's to kick the can, and the problem will, will, will get worse. You, 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 if we kick the can, then it will be worse in a couple of years. It, the, the debt will be higher. It, it will be just worse for everybody, for creditors and for Puerto Ricans. As simple as that. The facts are there. For example, I, I heard someone saying that we have enough money if we cut or if do go even further to pay the debt. In the bankruptcy process, the first thing that a debtor needs to prove to the court is that they have no money to pay. So they are safe. I just hope that Congress people remember the name of the, and the faces of those that lobby there, telling them that Puerto Rico have money to pay and there will not be such a humanitarian crisis. I just hope that the congressmen and congresswomen and the senators remember their faces and their names. Because the hedge funds and the budget funds and the creditors will need to change lobbyists. If the Congress people and senators remember their faces and their names. This questioner says, your remarks contained no reference to the long history of Puerto Rico's profligate spending or selling junk bonds to raise operating capital. Didn't Puerto Rico see this calamity coming years ago? Yes. And what responsibility does Puerto Rico hold for this crisis? Yes, a lot. It's, it's, the crisis began here. What happened? Section 986 uh, create a, se Section 936 allowed a competitive advantage, advantage to Puerto Rico to bring American companies to Puerto Rico. Those companies didn't went to Ireland or to Singapore or to Vietnam or to China or to Japan. They went to Puerto Rico. Um, um, why Congress approved Section 936? Because Puerto Rico was into a recession in the 70s because of the oil crisis. And with Section, section 936, Congress helped Puerto Rico to walk out of a recession. 20 years later, in 1996, they uh, repealed Section 936 with a 10-year phase-out period that ends in 2006. What happened in 2006? We walk into recession again because we lose that uh, tool. Where those companies went? Back to the States? The answer is no. They went to Singapore. They went to Ireland. So Congress sent those jobs, American jobs, to Singapore, to Ireland, to Vietnam, to New Zealand. What did what the government did in Puerto Rico to address that issue? Well, we lost wealth, and government, governors from both parties, both local parties, began to fill the gap with loans. Maybe waiting for the economy to revamp, but that doesn't happen. And then they began to take loans, to fill the gap and to pay loans. Between 2006 and 2012, Puerto Rico doubled the debt that was accumulated from 1981 to 2005. I'm sorry, for 1941 
to 2005. So what we accumulate from 1941 to 2005 was doubled between 2006 and 2012 because two governors tried to fill the gap and to pay loans with loans. That was wrong. And they knew it. But creditors knew it too. Creditors knew it too. They knew the numbers. They were there. They know the real thing. So I think that there's a shared responsibility in Congress, the government of Puerto Rico, and with creditors. How about you yourself? Did you do anything as governor to make the situation worse? And knowing now what you know, do you wish you had done anything differently? In a lot term? of things. A lot, yes. A lot of things. First, I was sworn in, and I decide. Uh, Kasia asked me in the elevator if I, when I was sworn in, if I thought that it was, uh, it would be that difficult, and the answer was no. The answer is no. The governor of Puerto Rico, my predecessor, used to say that the deficit was 333 million, 333. So I won. And during the transition process, we find out the deficit was 2,200 millions, $2.2 billion. And I thought, uh, thinking recount. <laughs> but in Puerto Rico, the law do not allow the winner to ask for a recount. So I decided not to convey the message to Puerto Ricans to drive a positive message that we will, this is the real thing, it's $2.2 .2 billion, but you know what, we, we, we will succeed. Let's fight together and we will make it happen. Let's forget the past. Let's look into the future. So. Uh, people claim, and I think they're right, that I means to communicate uh, the, the real problem uh, and to challenge the creditors and to challenge Congress earlier. Uh, uh, and I think that, that that's, that's my, uh, the main thing that I regret. Have you approached any of the Republican or Democratic presidential contenders to ask them to make the crisis in Puerto Rico a campaign issue, especially since the Latino vote is crucial to both parties in next year's election? Yes, uh, and I have to say, I don't want to miss anyone. Uh, Secretary Clinton addressed the issue in favor of Puerto Rico. Governor Martin O'Malley addressed the issue in favor of Puerto Rico. Senator Bernie Sanders addressed the issue in favor of Puerto Rico. Uh, Senator Marco Rubio addressed the issue in favor of creditors. I don't know if any other. Ah, Jeb Bush uh, addressed the issue, uh, 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 I think, for the restructuring process. So, uh, former Governor Bush, yes. I don't, I don't think if any other. And, and, and Marco Rubio know better. Senator Rubio, uh, other than Schumer and Gilbrand, they, represent, they, they are the ones that represent more Puerto Ricans in what it's called a battleground state. We'll be there, you bet. You think voters in that state and other battleground states will remember this issue when they go to the polls? Let me tell you. If we have an issue with Puerto Rican voters in the states, is that they remain attached to the island. 
they, they, what they see in TV is Puerto, Puerto Rico TV. The, what they see in the internet is the local newspapers. WAP America or Indy.com or, or the local news. They are not into American politics. But, but with inaction, Congress is bringing Puerto Rico to American politics because they know the crisis. They know the real thing. And of course, they, they will be on election day in the United States. They will not move back to Puerto Rico in the next 11 months. And I'll, I'll, I'll do my best for them to register. You bet. <laughs> I'll do my best. Everything within my powers. Why has the government of Puerto Rico been unable to produce the 2014 audited financial statements that Senator Hatch and other Republican members have requested? Has KPMG made an auditing mistake? Well, the, the, the fact is that it's not Puerto Rico that who released the uh, statement. It's the private company that we contract. Uh, and we provide with every information that I have asked, everything that I had asked. But they are following their process. Uh, we request them to, to, to do it, to do, finally do it. But we have done our part. But let me go further. That's, that's an excuse not to act. That's an excuse. They know the numbers. Conway and McKenzie did the report, an independent report. We, I commissioned, for the first time in the Commonwealth history, former chief executive, um, economic chief uh, from the uh, International Monetary Fund, Ann Krieger, Dr. Ann Krieger and her, and her team, to do a study, an independent study on Puerto Rico liquidity. And they released a study. So Congress has more information today of, about Puerto Rico finance than ever before. That's an excuse. They have the numbers. They know the truth. Uh, uh, economists that they bring to the hearing, Marsuash told them <laughs> that they do not need to. They will have it as soon as, as, came, as, soon as KPMG release it. But they, they have the numbers. If, if they are looking for excuses, they don't need to say anything. They just do whatever they want. You mentioned all the people leaving Puerto Rico and coming to the United States. What are you doing or can you do to stem the tide of people leaving? And what can you do to entice people who have left to come home to Puerto Rico? Very good question. The unemployment rate, the average unemployment rate between 2009 and 2012 in Puerto Rico was 16.5%. Right now, it's 11.4. So we are doing better, but to bring them back, we need to do a lot better. And to go to, sin to single digit from 16.5, you need to pass by 11.4 and and at some point. And we are there. So we are in the right direction. But to bring the man back and to keep those that we have, we need two, two more. That's why bringing our economy back is the key, is the single more important issue for Puerto Rico right now. Second, 2010, 2011, and, 2000, and 2012, were the years with the highest crime rate in Puerto Rico history. Puerto Rico is 100 miles per 35 miles. And in each of those three years, we have more than, more than 1,000 murders per year. Right now, we, are, uh, we have a little less, a little more than the half of what we had in 2012. We have more than the half that we, uh, what we had in 2011. So we have been able to reduce around 50%, a little bit more than, uh, more than 40, a little less than 50% uh, 
uh, of the crime rate in Puerto Rico. So if you reduce unemployment rate and you reduce crime rate, that's what everybody, everybody looks when, 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 when moved to some place to be uh, in a safe place and to be able to have a decent job to, to bring food to the table of the family. So uh, what we need to do, keep working on employment rate, keep working on crime rate. Both, both could go back up and will be part of the humanitarian crisis that will cost a lot, a lot to American taxpayers because of the inaction of Congress. This questioner says, last month I visited San Juan and was shocked at the number of restaurants and mid-sized hotels that had closed. Could you comment on these business closures and how the tourism industry is responding to this crisis? Well, uh, so sad that you didn't went there three years ago because then you will be crazy. The tur tourism is the, is the only sector of our economy that, that is already out of recession. Uh, no, the only hotel that closed during my administration is already working to reopen. The other that anyone see that were closed, closed uh, more than five years ago. We have been able to break records on cruise ships during the last 30 months. There have been no single moment where we have a hotel reopening or on construction, a new one. So you will see some, some that there's still some closed and restaurants, but they are back again. Just to give you an example, in 1986 was the first time that the International Airport received 8 million uh, uh, visitors. In 2010, for the first time since, we received less than 8 million. I was working to get back to 8 million in December 2014, and we went, we went to 8.5 million in, two, in, in, 2000, in December 2014. So tourism is, tourism is the, I may say, we are growing in manufacturing, we are growing in agriculture, we are growing in tourism, but tourism is out of recession, is way ahead the others. But there, as anyone can see with the hotels that closed in the past, and we are trying to reopen, I can name a few, the Renaissance, the Normandy, uh, the Intercontinental in Ponce that closed many years ago, we are working to reopen open those. There, there's still work to do. There's, there's still a lot of work to do. Will you call a special session of the Puerto Rico legislature to consider the PREPA revitalization legislation? Yes, that's something that I'm working with the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House in Puerto Rico. Uh, and that's a, a possibility. Will you wait for a Supreme Court decision to submit creditor settlements to the legislature? No, that will happen in June. And if, 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 we, do, if we should not to uh, call for an extraordinary session, uh, the new session will begin in January. So, so make no sense to wait until, until June or, or July. How do you expect your decision not to uh, seek re-election will affect Puerto Rico's negotiations with the creditor regarding the debt restructuring? Well, creditors will have no one to bet against. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, if they already spend on, um, on fundraisers against me, sorry. Uh, uh, Puerto Rico politics is not like United States politics. I have nothing to do with. I have been here in rallies. You should go to a, to a rally in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's 
Puerto Rico is a Latin American country. That's the truth. We are Latins that are American citizens. But we are Latins. Puerto Rico, are, this is a Latin American country. And we are very proud of it. And we want to remain Latins. I will give you some clues. Only 30% of the population is fluent in English. Counting me as fluent. <laughs> you know the ATM machines? Ask Puerto Ricans, or in Puerto Rico, anyone, to go to ATM machine in Puerto Rico if, if you want the instruction in Spanish or in English. 96% request the instruction in Spanish. Puerto Rico is a Latin American country. So we do campaign as a Latin American country. It's very intense, it's very, very intense. Rallies are of thousands of people. Uh, we do something that we call caravanas, uh, that is like hundreds and thousands of cars with flags and, and boom box, wagons with huge boom box, and we love it, we like it. <laughs> we really like it, we enjoy it, we, we, we are that. And we really like it, I, I, and I think this is a, it's a, it's a way, it's, it's the, best way, the best way to get the information to the people. Because you go ha house by house, and, and I like to be with people. Imagine that from January to November. And at the same time, with the other hand, trying to fix the fiscal crisis. There's a, there's a fight. There will, be a, a, there will be no chance of doing both things, fixing the crisis and preventing those that create the crisis to come back to power again in Puerto Rico. So, so I choose to be faithful to the future more than to the present of the island. And I, I think that that will allow me to uh, address all and, and to use all my energy to the more important thing that is to fix the crisis other than to be reelected. Governor, before I ask you the final couple questions, I have some housekeeping, so you can catch your breath for a moment. The National Press Club is the world's leading professional organization for journalists, and we fight for a free press worldwide. To learn more about the club, go to our website, press.org, and to learn about our nonprofit journalism institute, and to make donations to the institute, visit press.org slash institute. I'd like to remind you about some upcoming events at the National Press Club. Estonia's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Marina Kaljurand, will appear at a National Press Club newsmaker tomorrow, December 17th at 3 p.m. Anastasia Lynn, a Canadian human rights activist who was denied a visa to compete in the Miss World Finals in China this coming Saturday, will address a National Press Club luncheon on Friday, December 18th. And the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson, will address a National Press Club luncheon on Monday, January 11th. I'd now like to present our guest with the greatest prize of all at the National Press Club, our Thank traditional you. mug. Thank you. And we hope at a time when you can be gaining some rest back in Puerto Rico, you enjoy a nice warm drink out of that mug. I, I will. Coffee, of course. <laughs> so who do you think should be the next governor of Puerto Rico? <laughs> <laughs> I, I already choose. Uh, but being the president of the party uh, that I was elected for, I think that will not be fair if anyone wants to uh, run 
uh, knowing that the president of the party and the incumbent uh, will uh, try to tilt in favor or against any of the members of the party. So I think that we have a, a query of talent, of talent. I think we'll have, a, uh, we have more uh, people uh, that can do the job and I will be glad to help any liberal candidate as me uh, down there. And what will you do with your term? Liberal, I think here is progressive, right? <laughs> so it will be progressive here. I'm sorry? What will you do when your term ends? I have three kids and a wife, and we need to move forward. We need to work. I, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I like to farm. I'm a lawyer, but a very, very good person. Uh, uh, so I, I will go out and work. Uh, and uh, I, I was uh, in the practice of legal profession prior to be a state senator or a consumer's affairs secretary. So, uh, and I like to, to go to court and, and represent clients. So it's something that I like, I like very much. And I like to farm too, so I probably do both. You, unlike most previous governors of Puerto Rico, grew up on a farm. What did you learn down on the farm that has come in handy or been helpful to you as governor? <laughs> That's a very tempting question. <laughs> But I will avoid any uh, reference to cattle. Uh, cattle is when, when you go in the horse with the other animals, right? That's, no, I will avoid that. Uh, my grandfather, uh, who was my, my everything, I, uh, most, I was most of the time with him. Uh, taught me how to drive standard uh, manual uh, in a tractor when we were uh, breaking the ground, uh, uh, arando, plowing, plowing. And he always told me, look to the front, never look back, because we need to make this straight. If you look back, Inevitably, because the, the, the metals that, that break the ground are, are put in outside, you will get confused and, and you will steer. So look to the front. Forget about the, 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 the ground. And that was that something that I have been trying to do in the last three years. The last three years. Keep my eyes focused on the on the, on the end line, in the end line, and try not to look back and to not to blame people for, for, for where we are. And that make, make, make it harder, as I said before, because people sometimes want someone to blame. Uh, people know, everybody in Puerto Rico, I think 100% of the population know that we didn't create the crisis, but they, and they are right, want us to solve it. Uh, that's why I ask Puerto Ricans to just look to the front and to try to keep the, the working line uh, and to, to keep focus on, on our goal, that is bring Puerto Rico out of the recession and what will really solve the issue that is revamping our economy. Final question, Governor. Do you expect Puerto Rico to ever become a U.S. state? And if so, when? Hmm. The answer is no. A uh, pluribus unum. We are not part of pluribus unum. We are Puerto Ricans. And every time we have been asked in a fair question about Commonwealth independence and, and statehood, we had never been had an, I'm sorry, an, an answer of Puerto Rican over, over than 47% of statehood. The last time they, uh, they did some kind of mess of more than one question with more than one answer. Uh, and if you, uh, we, I call Puerto Ricans to vote blank because the Commonwealth wasn't on the ballot. 
and uh, prostate hooter sets that they have more than 50% because they do not count blank ballots. And the main opposite, back then opposite party call for a blank ballot. If you add the blank ballot, again, 46%. Uh, but, 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 but let's get real. Let, let's get real. First, we, we, we are Puerto Ricans. And second, let's go to the facts. pro commonwealthers progressive people will tell you that it will not work. pro statehood people will say it works. Let's go to the General Accountability Office, GAO. They issue a report on March 2014, last year. Go there on the burden of statehood for Puerto Rico. And you will see that statehood will destroy Puerto Rico economy. It's not a pro commonwealth position. It's not a pro-statehood position. It's a general accountability office position. That we will lose every competitive advantage that we have today. If you think that we have a deficit now, imagine if I need to reduce my budget to allow federal taxes. <laughs> it's, it's just crazy. And I will tell you a secret. pro statehooters never mentioned that report from the GAO. Never. They don't like it. There, there, there's the answer. From a soci sociological reason, we are Puerto Ricans that are American citizens. We are not American citizens that born in Puerto Rico. We are Puerto Ricans that have the American citizens. And we fight for that in the worst. First. And second, it will destroy our economy. So the answer is no. And, and the second question was when? Never. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for our speaker? I'd like to thank all of you for coming today, and I'd like to thank all of our viewers and listeners. I'd also like to thank the National Press Club staff, including its Journalism Institute and Broadcast Center, for helping us organize this event. If you would like a copy of this program, go to our website, press.org. Thank you so much. We are adjourned. <laughs>